All right, folks. So I'm here with Al Suarez, and he is an adherent, an adherent of Trotskyism. Um, and I hoped we could have kind of a debate discussion about Trotskyism, what it is, uh, what it stands for. I certainly am strongly opposed to Trotskyism, but Al Suarez is an adherent of Trotskyism. Now, Al, you had wanted me to give an opening statement, and then you would give an opening statement, and then we would kind of go into a back and forth from there. Does that sound good? That's right. All right. So, um, you know, my thesis has long been that there are two types of people who are attracted to socialism, right? Wherever you go in all of world history, you will find what you can call the revolutionary intelligentsia. And those tend to be middle class folks, younger people, intellectuals based around universities who are filled with anger at injustice and full of passion. Um, they want to tear down unjust institutions and they become attracted to ideas like Marxism, socialism and anarchism uh, as a way of kind of expressing their frustration and alienation with society and their idealism. And that's the, the first category. However, those folks don't make revolutions. Revolutions are made by the broad masses of people. It's the broad masses of people who normally aren't attracted to revolutionary politics. But when the system makes their life unlivable, uh, when they're sent to fight in unjust wars, uh, when the economy is in crisis, uh, they turn to socialism uh, as a way to get out of the disaster. During the 1930s Great Depression, the Communist Party USA put forward the slogan, the revolutionary way out of the crisis. And later they called it just the way out. And the broad masses of people turn to socialism because they're looking for stability. And that, you know, the Russian Revolution, it began among the children of the aristocracy, uh, the, you know, the young people, uh, uh, the, the middle class elements that were, you know, looking for chaos and looking to tear down injustice and behead every last king and capitalist. But Lenin had the brilliance of organizing the revolutionary intelligentsia in a way that they could push the broad masses of people into motion. And that after Lenin's death, the division between, you know, the forces that, uh, that represented uh, the broad masses of people and that revolutionary intelligentsia, that division once again uh, began. And that Trotsky incarnated kind of the ideals of the revolutionary intelligentsia. Now, I will say that I admire uh, there are there are things that Trotskyists have done that I admire around the world, right? You, Al Suarez, were an embassy protector, right? Sticking up for Venezuela. I absolutely admire that. That was 100% correct. I, you could be a Trotskyist, an anarchist, a social democrat, a liberal. Anybody who did that and supported Venezuela in that way gets, gets the approval card in my book. I think the Trotskyists organized in the Teamsters strike of 1934 in Minneapolis very heroically, and they did a great job with that. I know that uh, in the Chicago teachers strike of 2012, uh, the ISO, a Trotskyite organization, they were involved heavily and they organized for the rights of teachers in Chicago. So just because someone adheres to Trotskyism doesn't make them a bad person, doesn't mean I can't recognize that they do good things. But overall, uh, there's a reason that there are Hollywood movies glorifying Trotsky's life. Uh, there's a reason that the CIA set up a whole program to facilitate anti-Stalinist leftism called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Uh, there's a reason Trotskyists tend to be, you know, on the side of the U.S. government in almost every country in the world. Uh, there's a reason for this. Um, and there's also a reason that every anti-imperialist leader uh, around the world, whether it's Maduro, whether it's Bashar Assad, whether it's, uh, you know, you know, the people of I mean, even countries that don't adhere to Marxism, like Iran, Gaddafi, there's a reason they're all called Stalinists. You know, Western imperialism kind of almost approves of being a Trotskyist, but it has no uh, no respect for those who actually build socialism in some country and organize the broad masses of people. And so, you know, I hope later we can get into Trotsky's life, his ideas, but that's where I stand. I think Trotskyism is an expression of the middle class, petty bourgeois deviation of Marxism um, and the revolutionary intelligentsia. Where do you stand, Al? Yeah, it wouldn't be fair if... Um while you're making your opening remarks, I would take notes and add that to my opening remarks. So my opening remarks don't mention Maduro or anything like that, and I will be happy to respond to all of that after my opening remarks that I've prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and read them. All right. All right. Um, so just make sure I have it here correctly. Okay. Scrolling down here. Okay, <clears throat> Trotsky came from southern Ukraine and was part of Imperial Russia from a middle-class Jewish family. His father never learned to read but was a middle-class farmer. 
Notions Trotsky was wealthy are false. It should also be noted Trotsky discouraged the cult of personality, unlike Stalin, and told his followers to call themselves Marxist-Leninists, not Trotskyists. It was Trotsky's belief after Lenin's death he was maintaining his ideas and legacy. Lenin's version of Marxism at the time, which went from movement building to party building to building a new nation. With Lenin's decline, Trotsky formed the left opposition to oppose Stalin and the reversals he was making with the bureaucracy. Many Soviets joined his faction, especially in Leningrad, including at one time Lenin's widow. Stalin never forgave her for this, and we know from Khrushchev Stalin had her poisoned for this years later. Trotsky, in witnessing or taking part in these revolutionary developments, had a critical mind and read from authors at times he disagreed with, and still recommended their books throughout his life, like recommending the Russian anarchist Kropotkin's book, The Great French Revolution. Trotsky, in fact, made the case there was much to learn in Russia from the French Revolution. Trotsky believed, unlike many anarchists, in leadership. Nevertheless, Trotsky, like Marx, believed in learning from history, including revolutions of the past, even if they were bourgeois. When Marx was doing his writings around 1850, there were only three major countries that had a working class, Germany, France, and Great Britain. Marx stated at the time, quote, the source of world revolution will begin in France, move to Germany, and end in England, unquote. If we move a half a century later to Russia's first revolutionary attempt, often overlooked, of 1905, Trotsky was the only person in the Russian Marxist movement who believed workers could come to power. He was only 25 at the time, but was elected president of the Petrograd Soviet or Workers' Council. This was a city later named Leningrad, which is called St. Petersburg today. He no doubt, like Lenin, was a rising star in the Marxist movement in the early days, while Stalin and others were unknown till much later. When Marx wrote about the German revolutionary attempt, he ended his thesis by saying, quote, Let our slogan be henceforth the revolution in permanence meaning no deal or block with the bourgeoisie. Therefore, the idea of permanent revolution did not stem from Trotsky, but from Marx himself. It was an idea that caused controversy and polemics when Trotsky developed it. It is based in the belief workers must have independent class policy. The bourgeoisie never played a revolutionary role, nor in France or England. They started the ball rolling on issues with the king, but did not advocate overthrow as the masses did. Even the enlightened bourgeoisie did not advocate overthrow. The Jacobins, often glorified as leaders of the French Revolution, were in fact petty bourgeois, therefore not of the working class elements. If you look at the differences in history between farmers and workers, we see farm workers emerge in Latin America. For example, Evo Morales, a Bolivian cocolero or cocoa worker, emerged from that background before leading Bolivia. Therefore, the concept of one group competing for another for power is not always true. 3.5 million industrial workers existed in 1917 in Tsarist Russia, concentrated in urban areas like Moscow and Petrograd, when the general population was 150 million. However, the Soviet flag itself showed the unity between the proletariat or workers and the peasants or farmers, the hammer and sickle. In the 1880s and 1890s, factories opened in Russia. The landless peasants fled to the cities and went to work in factories. Trotsky said about these times, quote, Russian peasants were thrown into a seething cauldron of factory life, unquote. This was a result of the rich, uh, sorry, this was a result of the rise of rich farmers as a result of uh, the Tsar's policies. Therefore, the middle and lower farmers were left behind, eventually becoming uh, proletarianized. Anarchists were for revolution of the peasants. Marxists were for revolution of the workers in Russia at the time. Splits are part of the development of the revolutionary movement. So among the Marxists, uh, there were splits, such as the split of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in exile in 1903. It came down to a battle of ideas between two leaders in the party, Martov and Lenin. The Bolsheviks were called the hard or hardcore group. The Mensheviks were the soft or softies. Trotsky and Lenin did not see eye to eye at the time, but reconciled later. Bolshevik in Russian meaning, means majority, Menshevik meaning minority. The split came out of a tactical, not political difference. The Mensheviks believed objectively the Russian Revolution could be a bourgeois revolution, as its immediate task was the overthrow of the monarchy. In 1905, Lenin's slogan called for, quote, democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry, unquote. Dictatorship meaning all power to give it to. Lenin believed European workers sh should, uh, would show them how it's done. Then, together with them, they would bring about the social revo uh, socialist revolution. Trotsky said there, can be, there cannot be a bourgeois revolution uh, since they are tied with a, a thousand links to land-owning class 
uh, to land in classroom banks, linked to foreign capital as well, to British and French bankers, and could not end their role in World War I nor give land to peasants. Lenin and Trotsky, therefore, by 1917, advocated the overthrow of the, of the bourgeois provisional government of Kerensky, while the old Bolsheviks, including Stalin, wanted to continue to work with Kerensky, who had invited the exiles back to the country in February of 1917. The theory of permanent revolution states the peasantry, unlike the working class, cannot play an independent role. This is because the vanguard of the revolution. Sorry, I'm losing track of what I'm reading here. I'm almost done. Um, this is because the vanguard of the revolution has to be educated and the working class have to be more educated elements than the peasants. That is why Lenin advocated literacy and the Leninist policy was implemented in revolutionary Cuba, transforming the country into one of the most literate in Latin America under Castro, where the country was quite backward under Batista, the U.S. puppet. Leaders like Fidel Castro, Ho Chi Minh, and Hugo Chavez, although having left, having left this work with them uh, fr from the onset of their movements, all started out as bourgeois nationalist leaders. However, they did not become communist or socialists because they were backed by communist socialists who persuaded them to change their ways. They, in fact, became as such because of being pushed into it by Western imperialism, which, of course, was not the intention of the empires. Ho Chi Minh, being betrayed by the Americans in the 1940s and invaded by the French, turned to communism. Hugo Chavez, with the U.S.-backed coup attempt in 2002, brought in the British Trotskyist Alan Woods as an advisor and became openly socialist. Chavez had a transformation, so did Che Guevara. Che's writings from the 1950s versus the 1960s had a big contrast, as Che became friends with Belgian Trotskyist Ernest Mendel, and learned through implementing socialism in Cuba, he went away from Stalinism. So by the time Che entered Bolivia in Cognito to fight in his last fight, he was not the same ideas from 10 years prior. Castro was thrown into the arms of the Soviets when the U.S. refused to help Cuba, whose economy was sacked by Batista in 1959, and Che was happy when Fidel veered towards socialism. If you look back to the 1930s and the rise of Pum, who were fighting the fascists in Spain during the Civil War with internationalists like Orwell, they were brutally crushed by the Stalinists as they entered the war. Poon had leaders like Trotsky's former secretary, Nin, who was later captured by the Stalinists, where Comrade Nin was skinned alive. The backing of the bourgeois elements in Barcelona, the destroying of the militias and coalition parties like Poon, who were fighting the fascists on the front, resulted in a demoralization of the left, along with the Hitler-Stalin pact which started a few months later after the defeat of the left and the rise of Franco in Spain, in fact, the same year, 1939. Many left the, the Communist Party throughout the world as a result. Poland was split up, and World War II happened soon after. Now let us return to 1917. The old Bolsheviks like Kamenev and Stalin clung to the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry slogan of 1905 all the way into October 1917 and wanted to support the provisional government who kept Russia in World War I. Things, however, changed since 1905 in the movement. The old Bolsheviks didn't understand Lenin's method, only those words. Lenin had to go back to Russia and sort this out as they could as, as they could ally with the Bolsheviks temporarily in order to seize power. As Lenin was still a wanted man, he, didn't, he did so at a great risk and went incognito. Lenin and Trotsky united easily in 1917 since Lenin arrived at Trotsky's conclusion of 1905. The, the theory of permanent revolution was proven in 1917. The Bolsheviks would have never seized power without it. With the defeat of Leninism and the rise of Stalin, Stalin took the Menshevik position of two-stage theory, also known as socialism of one state. Many Stalinists were former Mensheviks. Lenin always combated this idea. Mensheviks believed the workers must not take power until any, under any circumstances. Shanghai Shek was also of two-stage theory, a bourgeois leader backed by Stalin in China who was opposing Mao. One example of many of this disastrous theory is the Indonesian Maoists themselves in, in the mid-1960s, who were also supporters of two-stage theory and backing the liberal dictator Suharto, which resulted in a banning of the communists and a massacre of at least a million communists. The Indonesian working class still is not covered from this. The notion of said theory is the bourgeois must take power, that the workers must subordinate themselves to the bourgeois liberals. This first stage is to consolidate bourgeois democracy, then someday socialism. Maybe in a hundred years, then talk about socialism in Russia. The bourgeoisie would not have made necessary forms if they were left alone in Kerensky's regime. It would have resulted in Russian fascism worse than German or Italian. Lenin said, quote, workers' democracy is a million times more democratic than bourgeois democracy, unquote. To revise this history and state that Lenin was for peasants only in power or for a bourgeois democracy, as many Stalinists do, is nonsensical and contradicts the facts. If Lenin considered Trotsky's ideas wrong, then why had he given him important positions in his government, such as the Commissar of War, Commissar of Foreign Affairs, and let Trotsky form the Red Army? 
which comprised of rag ragtag soldiers, former Tsarist officers who proved their loyalty and veterans of World War I. While many of the old Bolsheviks were critical and jealous of Trotsky's rise, he was getting things done and had the most and he had the utmost confidence of Lenin. The Soviet Union, still in its infancy, faced a civil war, 14 evading armies, an embargo from the West. As a result, Lenin and Trotsky advocated the new economic policy. The NEP was temporary and necessary, so limited uh, capitalism could emerge so the economy could strengthen and defend itself from the threat of war. This was, however, not rooted in two-state theory, as it was not done via a bourgeois revolution, which the old Bolsheviks, including Stalin, advocated. Venezuela not being fully socialist has garnered unfair criticism. This is where I mentioned Maduro very briefly. Um, Maduro's policies are still in line with Marxism since, like Tsarist Russia, Venezuela is still a developing country and needs limited capitalism. Once it is developed enough, it can implement full socialism. Of course, Venezuela, like the Soviet Union, Cuba, is going through its own embargo. However, Maduro, like Chavez, is of the working class and advocates for the poor and working class bettering their conditions. It's possible to be of the working class and still advocate for, uh, for the bourgeois. Batista himself in Cuba was not of the upper classes. However, a revolution led by the working class is what must be advocated. Stalinists, although not, not an imperialist themselves, as former Trotskyists believe, like the imperialists, sabotage chase efforts in Bolivia. And, and like the imperialists believe the killing of the revolutionary, where the killing of the revolutionary could destroy their ideas. They cannot be more wrong. And St Stalin ordering Trotsky's death in, in Mexico, it immortalized his ideas. So that's my opening statement. Okay. okay. Well, there's a number there's of things number. you said there um, that I would question. Um, you know, um, I, I can't respond to all of it because you went on for quite some time. Um, I guess one thing that you said is I believe you said the only person who believed the working class could take power in Russia was Trotsky. And I would disagree with that. Um, I think that there was a whole history of Russian Marxism, Gior Georgi Plekhanov, you know, the Bellman of Lenin, the Bolsheviks, you know. Um, you also mentioned, uh, you know, the issue of workers and peasants. And it seems like that was the primary disagreement between Lenin and Trotsky before the revolution is Lenin was calling for a revolutionary dictatorship of the workers and peasants, whereas Trotsky had this contempt for the peasantry, that they were a class without a future, they aspire to become bourgeois, and throughout his entire life, he has nothing but contempt for peasants. And you can see this in his writings on China. In right before Trotsky's death, the late 30s, he's writing as Mao is leading a glorious revolution. All over the world, people are admiring Mao, like the book Red Star Over China is a best-selling book. And Trotsky is writing about how the, the, the Chinese army is led by you know, peasants, and so therefore it's not revolutionary. Um, you know, Trotsky, he holds on to this this kind of elitist contempt for peasants, and he admires the West. Trotsky writes at one point that New York City is the foundry where the fate of mankind will be forged. Well, Lenin wrote an entire book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, explaining why Marx's prediction that socialism would first come to the Western countries and then, then expand to the developing world was incorrect. That it's because of imperialism. You have the development of the aristocracy of labor and the, you know, the stratification of the working class and the homeland, and the revolutionary energy is in the East. It's in the developing countries, where those countries are kept uh, out of you know, historical development. They're kept poor by imperialism and that they can fight for their liberation and move towards socialism in kind of a class collaborationist way, where the, the workers, uh, even some of the local bourgeoisie, you can have a block of four classes who fight to build socialism uh, on the basis of freeing their country from imperialism. And of course, the working class takes the lead because they are the, the biggest class with the most to gain, but it is a united front of forces that want to break out of imperialism. Uh, Trotsky's position on China, for example, you mentioned Chiang Kai-shek being someone who was supported. Well, the KMT movement in China was a mass movement. Dr. Sun Yat-sen is this, this figure that emerges in China. He builds a mass movement, the KMT nationalist movement, for you know, three principles, independence, democracy, and the people's livelihood. It's widely understood that the people's livelihood meant some kind of vague understanding of socialism. And you know, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the leader of the KMT, actually applied to join the Communist International. And Lenin wouldn't allow it because he was not a Marxist, but he was an observer. And the, the decision for the communists in China to go into the KMT and support the KMT as this mass progressive upsurge in China was overwhelmingly correct. I mean, when the Chinese Communist Party was founded, it was roughly 65 people. It became a party of millions of people because they joined in an anti-imperialist united front. Now, Chiang Kai-shek ended up betraying 
betraying the KMT, not just the communists, but the KMT. The KMT was for independence, democracy, and the people's livelihood. Chiang Kai-shek became a stooge of the Western imperialists and started killing communists. And so at that point, Mao and went into the countryside and they led a revolution of the peasantry. Um, and, and eventually the cities were seized and you had the Chinese revolution. Um, and I, I mean, it, it seems like, you know, this, this idea that the peasantry cannot play a revolutionary role is, is just not historically accurate. Well, now, can, I ask uh, can I ask you something now about China? Go ahead, yeah. Because uh, I don't know the numbers. I, have them, I don't have them in front of me. I had figures for Russia, but uh, do you know how many uh, working class people existed in China in 1949 when Mao took over? I know that at the time that the Chinese Communist Party was organizing in the 20s and 30s, it was a very small number. The population was overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelmingly peasants, right? Yeah, because like I said earlier, and you haven't disputed this, in, in the 1850s, in the time of Marx, there was only three major countries that even had an existing working class. And I think something else, and you'll probably agree with this, of why Mao was so successful is because the uh, co collaborative mentality is very much an Eastern culture and in Chinese culture. And so when Mao was advocating his version of Marxism, uh, the Chinese understood it uh, because they're not individualist. Well, I think it was more about the fact that China was oppressed as a nation, right? That the whole of China was oppressed, whether it was, I mean, they had signs in the parks that said no dogs or Chinese allowed. Right. And that, that only, only with Marxism could China really break the chains of imperialism, but all the classes of China had something to gain from that revolution. And in the, the four stars on the Chinese flag represent the block of four classes led by the Chinese Communist Party. And that in itself, you know, debunks Trotsky's theory of the permanent revolution, that only the working well, class, only the industrial worker well, can make it. Back to 1905 in, in, in Russia, so in Tsarist Russia. So uh, you, you kind of misquoted me there because I'm not, I'm, I was saying that Trotsky was the only figure who was developing permanent revolution in 1905 which advocated for workers' democracy. There was a polemic or a debate going on at the time with, with Lenin and others about how they were going to divide up whenever they would take power, power, uh, power with the workers. I'm sorry, with the peasants. But, but, but like I alluded to earlier, in the late 1800s, a lot of those workers were peasants. They were entering the factories. Oh, yeah. um, and so uh, let, let me take it back also to... Uh, uh, so actually, not back. Let, let me take a more... Uh, recent uh, Maduro, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm an embassy protector, so I have contacts down there in fluent in Spanish. So, um, you know, Maduro went on the record and said that people that are calling him the Stalin of the Caribbean are absurd. He took that as an insult. Uh, and then I like to give quotes. You heard in my opening statement, I gave some quotes. I, I've yet to see a quote where Maduro has said verbatim, I am a Stalinist. The few times he talked about Stalin, he distanced himself from Stalinism. And like I said, Alan Woods was an advisor of Chavez, and Maduro was there as well. So they had some influence from Trotskyists. I'm not saying that Chavez was a Trotskyist or an or Orthodox Trotskyist or anything like that. Right? There's many different interpretations of Trotskyism. But certainly there was an influence there. And I've never seen a speech where Chavez or Maduro said they were Stalinists. Uh, there's been speeches where Chavez has said we need to not be like Napoleon. We need to be like Trotsky. Uh, and everybody knows uh, in, in, Marxist, in Marxist language what that means. Napoleon, I mean, Stalin's called the, the Russian Napoleon. Uh, so maybe he didn't come out and say, you know, I'm anti-Stalinist not to offend certain people. Uh, but uh, certainly, he, I've never seen a speech where Chavez has said, I am a Stalinist, or well, Stalin great things, or, you know. Why would he say that? I mean, Venezuela is a completely different situation. Um, and Stalin himself uh, scolded the U.S. Communist Party for calling themselves Stalinists. He said, there's no such thing as Stalinism. He said, I'm only a Marxist-Leninist. So, you know, I don't know, I, I don't think Maduro is putting into practice Stalin's economic or political policies. It's not a one-party state. Uh, but you, you were interesting because you support Maduro, right? And you say Venezuela is not fully socialist. Uh, you, you support Maduro, but you then condemn the Communist Party of Indonesia for supporting Su Suharto. And I, I'm curious about that. Um, because Suharto is not Maduro. Suharto was a liberal Democrat. He, he didn't represent the, the working class. He represented the bourgeoisie. Well, I think he openly advocated building socialism in Indonesia. Um, he was he was talking about Marxism. I mean, he was he was like Maduro, except he didn't have support among the military. Um, and I don't think it was incorrect for the communists of Indonesia 
to support, uh, you know, a very popular leader who is redistributing land, who is nationalizing industries, moving the country towards socialism. I think it was good they supported him. I think the problem was that the military in Indone- Indonesia didn't support it. But what is the difference? Why why is Suharto different than than Maduro? Why is it okay to support well, Maduro, you, but not okay to support Kennedy, President Kennedy instituted the Alliance for Progress in Latin America and advocated for agrarian reform. Uh, our founding fathers, uh, Benjamin Franklin had advocated, he didn't use the words grain reform, but he said any man that has too much land, it should belong to the state. So you had plenty of bourgeois leaders who have advocated grain reform. Just like just because Suharto talked about socialism and had some minimal grain reform does not mean that he was a Marxist or he was trying to make a, a workers' democracy. So so what is it what is it that makes Maduro different? Because I understand there's a huge amount of private enterprise and stuff in Venezuela. I would say Venezuela is a fully socialist country. The economy is centered around oil. Uh, oil then subsidizes the industries. The government controls the, the major centers of economic power. The way I see it, Venezuela is is fully socialist. They say they're on the road to a socialist ideal, and I respect that. But I would say it's not a capitalist country. At this point, I would say the state is in the hands of, of you know, revolutionaries. Do you think uh, that China has capitalism? What? Do you think that China has capitalism? And I would say that China is a socialist society, and like most socialist societies in our age, it has a market sector, a very big market sector. But overall, you know, um, it's about 50 percent state ownership. The government controls major industries. It controls banking. Um, you know, I think there's more state ownership in China than there is in Venezuela. Um, you know, but but again, Maduro, you know, took power uh, just like you know Chavez did through elections. Um, they proceeded to you know changed the nature of the nationalization of the oil, so it was really nationalized. They were using the state. Uh, Chavez was in a coalition with capitalists when he first took power, started moving towards socialism. I don't understand if, if, if it's a crime for workers and communists to support Dr. Sun Yat-sen, if it's a crime for workers and communists to support Suharto, why is it okay for them to support Maduro and Chavez? What makes them different? I'm not even saying it's necessarily a crime, but in hindsight, we know it was a mistake. Communists were massacred in Indonesia. You can't compare the situation in Indonesia. Maduro hasn't gone out of his way to massacre communists in, in Venezuela. But, it's a but, completely but, different situation. They, massacre communists. So, they, were, they were massacred after he was overthrown in the 1965 coup. But they were among his biggest supporters, the communists were. Um, and in fact, he depended on them. And he was even setting up an army of, of communists, from what I understand. He was setting up a separate wing of the armed forces that would be uh, made up primarily of communists. Uh, he wasn't massacring communists. He was. So what was the name? What was the name of the Indonesian leader in 1965 who took over? I believe that was uh, Sukarno, right? People get the two names mixed up all the time. But the, the point I'm trying to make is there was a backing from communists in Russia of the bourgeois leaders in Indonesia. And it, it resulted in, in chaos. But let's not talk so much about Indonesia because I want to get to the to the present and, and Venezuela. We, we touched on Russia, we touched on China, we touched on Indonesia. Let's let's get to to Venezuela here. That that's where my expertise are on. Okay, so um, Maduro uh, comes from working class background. That that's important to emphasize. People say that Trotsky is part of the aristocracy. As I addressed in my opening statement, that's an exaggeration. His family were middle class, but Maduro, like Chavez, does come from the working class. Um, he was the president uh, of the uh, bus workers uh, and uh, union uh, before he uh, entered the, the Chavista movement. And uh, the majority of people uh, that support Maduro and that are involved in the political left and Venezuelans love history. They don't just focus on the, the geopolitics of their country. You know, they have the discussion about Stalinism and Trotskyism there all the time. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're educated, but of the working class. And so the people that were back in the door, duo, the majority, if they weren't Trotskyists, they were, uh, you know, influenced by Trotsky or had sympathetic views of, of what Trotsky was trying to do alongside Lenin. There's a minority of Stalinists there. But again, I've never seen a speech where nor Chavez, nor any of his ministers, nor, nor Maduro are saying that, that they're, that they're Stalinists. It's kind of a, uh, I don't want to say there's this history, but it's, it's going on in the present, but it's kind of revising, uh, you know, it's like when people say, and I addressed this in my opening statement, that permanent revolution was invented by Trotsky. You, you know, that's not true. Uh, I quoted very clearly Marx and what he said, and it all stemmed from, from Marx. 
And yes, Trotsky was was trying to develop something for the first time that was revolutionary in 1905. I believe it happened in 1917, proven him right, because you had a, a workers' revolution. There was enough working class people by then, and there was a vanguard by then, an educated vanguard, not necessarily intelligentsia, but an educated uh, vanguard that were able to help to take over and overthrow uh, the czar at the time. And so the difference is tactics right now, right? Because in, in Venezuela, they were democratically elected. But there's a lot of, well, go ahead. Well, I mean, oh. I don't deny that there is a big Trotskyist influence in Venezuela. I mean, I know about Alan Woods and the international Marxist tendency and the fact that they had some influence there. I don't think they have much influence any longer, but they really did have a great deal of influence, I think 2007, 2008 ish. Um, and it makes sense that, that Trotskyism would have an influence in Venezuela as it has a big influence in the global Marxist movement now, because it's the kind of Marxism that the bourgeoisie has chosen to promote. Like there are Hollywood movies promoting Trotsky. The Congress for Cultural Freedom promotes Trotsky. They don't, they don't necessarily portray Trotsky in a, in, a, in a good way. You said they glorify him. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. There was things they could have omitted. They showed him having an affair with Frida Kahlo. You see what I'm saying? So they, they show him against that weren't necessarily true about him. So Hollywood doesn't necessarily glorify him. Right, but but the, the Congress for Cultural Freedom and the CIA certainly glorified him. I mean, Sidney Hook, the leader of the CIA's program, was himself a former Trotskyist. Um, and all over the world... Uh, all when revolutionary the movements were infiltrated by the CIA. To so because it was infiltrated by the CIA doesn't mean that it was Trotsky's intention for his organization to be run by the, by the imperialists. No, but I'm but but I think that the, the point is, though, that the reason Trotskyism is so prevalent around the world is because the imperialists find it useful um, and they found it useful in Hungary. They found it useful in Czechoslovakia, all over Eastern Europe in the late uh, 1980s, early 90s, when socialist governments were being overthrown. Right. The Western imperialists called it glorious revolutions. What was happening was counter revolution. Right. The Soviet Union was toppled. Those countries were opened up to international banks, looted the country. The rate of sex trafficking went through the roof. The overthrow of socialism was a historical abomination. I mean, it resulted in mass death and suffering like we've never seen before. Well, you know, Trotsky always supported the socialist based economy under Stalin. The, the Trotskyists that, that, that were part of the movement that claimed that Stalin was a capitalist or imperialist or they didn't want to support the Soviet Union that were with Finland, for example, they were thrown out because that was against what, what Trotsky was about. Uh, as a matter of fact, I saw one of your, your videos, you talked about Cannon. Um, uh, James Cannon's differences, and you know he wasn't a lawyer. Yes, yeah, his book's there, yeah. But, but James Cannon's differences with, with Schmackman and the other comrades uh, was not so much about class, but was the fact that Shackman was calling Stalinist imperialist. And that goes against what, what Trotsky w was saying. Sure. So you have to be careful not to say, okay, the Soviet Union was overthrown and then the Trotskyists liked it or something like that. No, the Trotskyists were also upset that the socialist based economy collapsed. And a lot of people in the Soviet Union want to return to the Soviet Union as a result. The thing is, under a totalitarian Stalinist society that lacks freedoms, there's problems there too. You need a society where there's freedoms and also a socialist based economy. And in a worker democracy like advocated by Lenin and Trotsky, they would have provided these freedoms. Well, see, that's interesting. Now, now let me respond. There's a few things you said there I want to respond to. Like the first thing is, right? I would say that 99.9% .9 of people who call themselves Trotskyists are not like you, right? You know what Trotsky actually said. I worked with the CDC. You had Marty Goodman from Socialist Action. You know, the Trotskyists nowadays are very united. You don't see those like, orthodox sectarian ways anymore. Right. Well, right. most people that call themselves Trotskyists, they do it simply because they don't want to be associated with Stalin, right? They've heard that Stalin is evil. The communism is evil, and they want to be able to say, look, I'm a communist, but I'm not like the bad kind. I'm not a Stalinist. I'm a Trotskyist. And that's all it's about, right? And that's why they say things like the Soviet Union was state capitalist and imperialist, even though well, Trotsky no, said Trotsky. the opposite of that. Because cause stop, I mean, Trotsky made emphatically clear that you can't call the Soviet Union stop, uh, imperialist and call yourself a Trotskyist. It's like saying uh, the was what they did was what the price one, you know? <laughs> All right. Most people who adhere to Trotskyism don't even really care what Trotsky said. I'm agreeing with you. They just do it as a, a gesture of trying to gain favor with the capitalists and the imperialists. It's a way to, to it's a cowardly move on most people's part. Now, you are the exception, right? Marcyism, which I come out of. There's a history of me with Marcyism is the exception. But most people that are Trotskyists simply do it 
because they want to gain favor with this society and with imperialism. When I go to the, the forums, like the left forum in New York that I used to go to all the time, the majority of the people there are either Maoists or Trotskyists. There's very few open Stalinists that show up. And, and these people that show up there, they're very educated. They're not just showing up there to say, oh, I'm a Stalinist. There are people that are discussing different works, and, and, and they're not all from the upper classes, mind you. Some of them, like, I've gone there on scholarship. I couldn't even afford to buy a ticket to the left forum. I'm, I'm of the working class. So you got a lot of people like me that showed up and, to left forum, and it's, it's not full of uh, middle class or upper middle class people uh, saying, oh, I'm just here because I'm not a Stalinist. These were people that were very educated, were very familiar with class work, and it's my view that they actually Why represent the majority. Why did they say the Soviet Union was state capitalist and imperialist? If... if if they if they they're educated and they know what Trotsky said, why do they why don't they agree with you? I mean, you're arguing my point. Well, let me tell you, this. the founder of ISO, and there's a common claim here. Um, the the founder of ISO, I can't think of his name right now, but I've I've looked him up, and you know he was one of those people that was saying, and this was when Trotsky was still alive, that uh, Soviet Union was imperialist. I'm sorry, Tony Cliff. Yeah, it must have been him. So he was saying that. Uh, he was one of the fire, founders of ISO, and him and Trotsky had a polemic as a result. Yeah. And several people that were, tro were Trotskyists in ISO left the organization. Here we are all these years later, and they're saying that all the DSA leadership or all the ISO leadership are Trotskyists, and they're all conspiring in so to, to favor regime change. That sounds like conspiracy theory to me. I'll give you an example. I have a lot of respect for uh, Max Blumenthal and, and his journalistic work. Uh, you know, he was also involved at, at the embassy, but he wrote a very controversial uh, article uh, some time ago, and I challenged him to a debate as a result. And in that article, basically was saying that not just DSA leadership, and I have issues with DSA leadership, but it was saying rank and file, all these people, all these Trotskyists are pro-regime change. And that's just not true. And that's why I'm glad you've given me, and I'm thankful that you've given me the opportunity to defend my views because, you know, Polemics happen like that, and there's not an opportunity for both sides to, to discuss it. But I'm sure you can concede that, that Stalin's tactics, sending a, a, a opponents to the gulag, you know, how vicious he was against Trotsky is how he demoralized the left and all these moves. I mean, you got to admit, that's not a, a benevolent benevol leader by any means. Well, well Al, now you got to let me respond here and not interrupt me now. I've, I've let you talk. Now you got to. Yeah. First of all, I, I agree with you that the majority of people calling themselves Trotskyists disagree with what Trotsky said and don't defend the Soviet Union, don't say it's a degenerated workers' state, they say it's state capitalist, and that that's not correct in terms of what Trotsky said. And that further makes my point that most people at this point who embrace Trotsky don't do it because they actually care about what Trotsky said. They do it because they are they are trying to disassociate themselves from actually existing socialism, right? And that there are some exceptions, right? Like Marxism, uh, which I come out of, and others. But let me also add that you know you talk about you just you just said you know is Stalin repressive? Well, you know right after the Bolsheviks took power, like a week after they took power, they implemented the death penalty for drinking alcohol, and they forcibly conscripted all the men into the military. That's a horrendous. I would never want to be in a situation where people are getting shot for drinking alcohol, where all kinds of people are being conscripted. But it was in the context of a civil war in which they were being surrounded and they had to use the most ironclad authoritarian discipline. And Trotsky himself was very brutal, very brutal and very repressive to the workers opposition. He is the guy who put down the Kronstadt revolt. Trotsky sent a lot of people to the firing squad. He executed all well, kinds of people. Deserters. Repressive. In an extreme situation. That's how they dealt with deserters. He had no problem with political repression until he himself was politically repressed. And his disagreement was not about the Soviet Union not being democratic enough. His disagreement, in essence, was that the Soviet Union was not following his theory of permanent revolution. He wanted the Soviet Union to be a temporary military holdout in an all-out crusade to seize the West in his fantasy of, of permanent revolution. And Stalin saw that the people, the workers yeah. and the peasants of Russia, had been through war, millions had died, they were being blockaded, and that it was time to build socialism in one country. And what Stalin did with the five-year economic plans, where he industrialized the country, he raised people out of poverty, he built huge power plants, he elected, I mean, he built running water, 
Uh, rural huts were replaced with you know, modern housing units in the name of socialism in one country. Stalin achieved huge things, but he wouldn't have been able to do that. He wouldn't have been able to do that if they had maintained the theory of permanent revolution, because in order to do it, they had to make deals with the West. They had to they had to bring in, uh, you know, technicians and engineers from Western countries. They had to they had to sign treaties. Right. There, there were a lot of Henry Ford went and did business in the Soviet Union and had joint ventures with Soviet enterprises. And, and he was, he was very good friends with, uh, with the Nazis. Yeah, they did business with all kinds of countries. And if the Soviet Union had re remained committed to this belief that they were just in it for this bloodthirsty fantasy for the West, um, they would never have been able to raise all, all the people out of poverty as they did, number one. And number two, they wouldn't have lasted because the Russian peasantry and the Russian people were tired of war. I mean, you, you talk about the 1920s in Russia. Trotskyists like to glorify it like it was a good time. That was not a good time. Millions of people were dying. I mean, there was a blockade. They couldn't get medicine. I mean, it was, and when, you know, and you compare that to when Stalin was industrializing great. it. I understand. Let me just put my two cents in real quick, Caleb. So I when, you can speak. Yeah, okay, great. So when, when the uh, Russian Civil War ended in the uh, early 1920s, it was a good time because they, they won. I mean, there was devastation as a result, but they were able to uh, start an independent policy. Uh, they were able to build themselves up. Uh, so there was a time in, in Lenin's government that was good when the Civil War ended, and there was opportunities to start reversing these emergency policies. Now, Stalin was never head of the Soviet government during the Civil War. So you, you can't justify it because all this time, all these decades that, that Stalin was head of the, the Soviet government, they were not in the Civil War. Yes, there was a war later on, which was World War II, but from the, from the end of the Civil War, all the way to World War II was peacetime. And yet all these temporary emergency measures were maintained by Stalin to, to make a dictatorship for himself, not for the proletariat. So uh, I'll give you an example. I support right now UBI, right? But I'm also a socialist. So I do not support UBI permanently. We need a socialist based economy that will guarantee employment. This is an emergency me measure because we're in a crisis. So those emergency measures, the, the repression of dissenters, of deserters, when they were having a ragtag army holding on to the soldiers they could against the menace and four debating armies, like I mentioned earlier, that were backing the, the white guards during the Civil War, those were all temporary measures. It was always Trotsky's intention, just like it was Lenin's intention. They had said this emphatically, and it was always in their writings, to make a workers' democracy. I quoted Lenin earlier. He said, a workers' democracy is a million times more democratic than a bourgeois democracy. You might have had a socialist-based economy under Stalin, but you did not have a workers' democracy. This is what happened with the two-stage theory. Not just in the foreign policy I mentioned earlier, like in Spain and in those countries under Stalin, but within Soviet society itself. There was a lack of democracy, lack of voter, lack of freedom. And that, that's, that's the issue is. And, and again, I'm, I want to make this very clear. I'm not staying in my view. And maybe we can put a poll out later in the Trotskyist groups of what books they read of Trotsky and demonstrate what books they read of Trotsky. But it is not my view that the majority of, of Trotskyists uh, are not familiar with Trotsky or contradict Trotsky. There are some, of course, and in every movement, and I'm not comparing, I'm quoting John Reed here and saying Trotsky is a Jesus uh, or, or a saint. But if you could put it in terms, I, I alluded to this earlier, it's like saying the Crusaders that all the ideology of the crusaders that were invading Palestine at the time uh, was told to them by Jesus Christ. They were taking what Jesus said out of context or maybe not even understanding the Bible and using it as a cover for their own imperialist war at the time, their, their religious wars. So it's the same with, with, with groups that claim to be Trotskyists or have Trotskyist elements within it uh, that, are, that are calling their opponents, like the Stalinists, uh, imperialists when they're not imperialists. Uh, Certainly, Stalin, just as Hitler and other leaders, Napoleon, were totalitarian. Uh, it was authoritarian, totalitarian, that people lacked freedoms. Uh, there was paranoia. People were rounded up. And this went on for, for decades. Like Khrushchev, and I'm not saying Khrushchev was a saint either, but Khrushchev, I think, did a lot of good. And he tried to reverse a lot of what, what uh, Stalin had done. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned him earlier. You know, he showed how Stalin poisoned people and, you know, the original Bolsheviks, how they eventually were were wiped out. 
But, you know, Stalin in the beginning, as an old Bolshevik, as I referred to earlier, him with Kerensky and, uh, and others, not Kerensky, Kamen and others, wanted to work with the bourgeois leader Kerensky in early 1917. Uh, Lenin had to come in and put a stop to this. And that's why Trotsky and Lenin united at the time, because they both agreed on this, that you can't back the bourgeoisie. Therefore, they were backing a permanent revolution. I saw one of your videos said a lot of Trotsky don't understand permanent revolution. I, I understand it very well. And people, again, that claim that this idea came purely from Trotsky. No, it came from the words of Marx, and Trotsky developed it in the early 1900s. Let me be clear on a couple points, though, right? Um, now, first of all, I'm, I'm going to you know, go backwards, uh, but with Kerensky, right? Now, Lenin was very careful. If you look at the position, Kerensky came to power because of the uprising against the Tsar. And while the Bolsheviks offered no support to the Kerensky government, they did not call for its overthrow. They were strategic in how they operated. And actually, the reason the Bolsheviks ultimately took power is because they defended the Kerensky government from the Kornilov reaction. General Kornilov was going to come in and install himself as the military dictator and overthrow Kerensky. The Bolsheviks mobilized defense of Petrograd, St. Petersburg, from the uh, from the the Kornilov reaction, and it was actually because they defended Kerensky and they defended a, a bourgeois government from fascist reaction that they ultimately took power. Um, that was the moment where you know the the, the government in Saint Petersburg started handing over the, the keys to the armories to the Bolsheviks. They were building a bigger army. They were essential, and it was through defending Kerensky that they ultimately took power. Um, so it's not correct to say he said we'll never support Kerensky. You know, his position was careful. It wasn't just blindly follow Kerensky, put the program in our own vision, but Lenin defend Kerensky for counter-revolution. I understand. Lenin called the, the liberals uh, useful idiots. He said that you could work temporarily with the anarchists and the liberals like Kerensky, but eventually they had to go away. So that was all tactical. So uh, why, why could we not tactically support Dr. Sun Yat-sen? Why can we not tactically let me, let me answer that. I need to say that? So so that doesn't mean no, in that situation that the, the, KMT, the betrayal of the Chinese Revolution. He says that that by supporting the KMT, Stalin is responsible for the crimes of Chiang Kai shek, right? right? In Spain, he condemns support for the Spanish Republic. This belief that you can never have an alliance with bourgeois progressives, that you must have this pure working class line, that is a central part of Trotsky. I'm talking about Spain. Okay, I live in Spain, and I've, I've studied the history thoroughly, and I've mentioned it in my, in my opening statement. Yes. So what I'm trying to say is once the Soviet Union was powerful and it established itself, it had a responsibility in its foreign policy to support other communists in other countries. Instead, it preferred to back bourgeois leaders. That's not the same thing as a temporary uh, alliance with Kerensky. And, and so let me talk to you about Spain. I mentioned earlier, Poom. Poom was a political party and a militia that was very important in Spain that were starting to defeat the fascists. If you read George Orwell and other internationalists that, that took part in actions against Franco's forces in Spain, they were successful and, and, and they were starting to defeat them in their battles in Aragon, outside of Barcelona, and all those areas in Spain. What happened? What happened was uh, Stalin came in and started making all these conditions to get support for Soviet rifles because Spain, uh, the Spanish Republic was getting support uh, from Mexico, but their, but their rifles were very bad quality, but they were using to fight against Franco's forces. So they were relying on the, on the Soviet aid, but the Soviets came and they meddled and they came with their, with their uh, socialism one state theory. And they said, we need to bring the bourgeois back to Barcelona, started demoralizing the left. Then they went in and rounded up Poom. They killed his, his leader viciously, as I told you earlier, and the Poom was comprised not just of Trotskyists, you know, back up here and be clear what we're yeah. talking about. Spain has a Republican government, an elected government, a, a, a popular republic that comes out of a revolution. That government has communists and socialist elected deputies, right? And Franco uh, wants to overthrow them and set up a fascist dictatorship, right? And so the Soviet Union is coming to the aid of the Spanish Republic and trying to build an alliance of people to defend the Spanish Republic from fascism. And instead of supporting the Spanish Republic, the Trotskyites launch an uprising against it, saying they're neither for the Spanish Republic or for fascism, they're for pure communist revolution or whatnot, right? And 
You know, I mean, George Orwell, I cannot think of a greater propagandist for the imperialists. I read Animal Farm in school. I read 1984 in school. That is pure anti-communist bourgeois propaganda, right? I mean, you know, the, the Russian proletariat is portrayed as the horse, as stupid people that get sent to the gulag. I cannot think of a nor more counter-revolutionary writer than George Orwell. I mean, he had other the Russian peasants oh. utter contempt for the Russian workers. And the fact that you would trust him. I mean, this is a guy who worked in the Ministry of Information of the oh. British government. He was a I, British intelligence officer, for goodness sake. So I, I if I could finish, heard that he's most, some of his literature is valid, just like some of Kropotkin's literature that I mentioned earlier is valid. Does that mean that I adhere to anarchist thinking? No. Does that mean I adhere to what Orwell's thinking was? No. He, he was more of an anarchist as well. Um, but what, what I'm saying is that uh, Orwell, uh, you know, he was a prominent figure. His, his literature had made some uh, valid, valid points. Um, the, uh, let, go ahead. let me also mention, you mentioned before that the, intro, the I'm sorry. Union was not in civil war in the 1930s, right? It wasn't from, from the time of the end of the Civil War up until World War II, they were not at war. I don't agree with that. I think that regardless of the fact that the Soviet Union, there weren't invading armies within their borders. The Soviet Union was always fighting for its life. It was always surrounded. It was always blockaded. And any ability to make a treaty or a deal was the exception. The capitalists never gave it a moment of peace. And that, that the situation where the Soviet Union became a very authoritarian country, I don't deny that human rights were violated and all of that, but that was due to the fact that the Soviet Union was trying to build socialism surrounded by imperialism. And Trotsky himself admits this. If you read The Revolution Betrayed, Trotsky writes right. at length about how the rise of what he calls the Stalinist bureaucracy, it wasn't a moral abomination, it was the natural outgrowth of those circumstances. When countries are, are impoverished and developing and trying to build socialism, they don't have the luxury of doing it with a pure egalitarian democratic way. And if you want the Soviet Union to be more democratic, you should fight the imperialists and get the imperialists off their back. You shouldn't go around joining with the imperialists and condemning the Soviet Union, echoing their denunciations like Trotsky did. Trotsky spent the last years of his life when he was in exile. He was a professional anti-communist. He wrote for the, the newspapers of William Randolph Hearst. The what fact you on, what, on what the word communist means. The, the, you know, the state is supposed to wither away. You're not supposed to have a Stalinist bureaucracy. That's not what that's not what communism is to, to me as a Trotskyist. And I was trying to ask you earlier, and I, I had to write it down. The intro, let me ask you something real quick. The intro of 1984, the intro that was not originally published with the book. Did you see that intro that, that came out years later that Orwell wrote? No. So in that intro, he said that the society I'm describing could, could be here in, in Great Britain. A lot of people interpreted it uh, as being Stalinist. I mean, I don't think it was Orwell's fault if he's describing totalitarianism and, and a lot of these people are saying Stalin. I mean, that's the correct characteristics of, of, of his regime. And we know that from literature that was that was smuggled out. But he was almost saying Great Britain could become that way. He said that in the intro. And again, this is not a defense of Orwell. I am not a hearing of, of anarchism or Orwell's beliefs. I'm just saying he's somebody you can learn from, just like Kropotkin. Well, and, and the CIA else, found and, him to be very useful, and they paid for a movie of his book Animal Farm to be created. I mean, you know, and he worked for the British Ministry of Information. He actually worked for the British state. I mean, he was a state propagandist. Bruce, for the and not just the time, but he was doing it by fascists. He thought it was the best way to fight fascists. I don't, I don't, I don't want to join up with the bourgeoisie like that to fight fascists in those circumstances. But that's what Orwell did with the intention to fight fascists. And I think he was a, a fervent anti-fascist and held on to uh, kind of social democratic anarchist uh, beliefs. But I want to make the point real quick that the minority, communism. That's why it's effective anti-communism. It contains criticism of Western society of conformity. It's middle class individualism. Right. And that they discovered that was the whole point. The CIA discovered in the 1950s that McCarthyite anti-communism could only go so far and that the way to effectively fight communism was by putting out this kind of middle class, you know, crit critique. That's why they set up the Partisan Review magazine and had the writings of Susan Sontag and others. Right. Is that it's much more effective. Not saying the CIA invented Trotsky. The CIA wasn't around till eight years after Trotsky died. <laughs> they found Trotskyism to be very useful. Right, it's very useful. Right, it's not you know, the uh, uh, itself, but but I'm trying to say something. So a minority, a minority of the 
workers in Catalonia, in Spain at the time of the Civil War, would call themselves Trotskyists, okay? So the Trotskyists didn't have that big of influence. To say the Trotskyists caused the overthrow of the Republican government is, is an overstatement. What happened was you had a workers' revolution during the Civil War, the bourgeoisie was thrown out of Barcelona, the Pru militia started fighting the fascists, they were very successful in that fight, they brought in internationalist elements, uh, even Hemingway was there at one time, besides Orwell. Again, I'm bringing up these people not to say I hear all their beliefs, but just an example that prominent people were there at the time fighting the fascists. And so with all of that going on, they ended up being demoralized when they rounded up the Pum. And when they when they brought in, in exchange for the for the uh, so-called Soviet rifles, they made all these conditions and brought back the bourgeoisie and there was a demoralization. And then as I mentioned, the open estate later that year, there was Hitler-Stalin pact, which I think was Why a... a very prevent, Why would Stalin want to prevent the rise of socialism in Spain? Why would that be in his interest? He found out that Conrad Min was the founder of Pum. And he was very paranoid about Trotskyists. The fact that Min had worked for Trotsky as his secretary, he wanted to pay all the Pum members as Trotskyists, which is false. They were a coalition. So and and understand Trotskyists could take any power in Spain. And so he wanted to crush it. You know, and and he wanted to crush bourgeoisie because that was also in line with his theory, to be fair. It wasn't just a personal thing. It was in line with his theory. But... Uh, that's those are the two primary reasons. Well, I I find the idea that 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 tr that Stalin would work to overthrow the Spanish Republic purely because he didn't like Trotskyists to be absurd. I didn't say that. And I think that that I, the say, idea I, say, I did not say that Stalin overthrew the, the Republican government. Uh, what I, what I was saying is that after the workers revolt against the Republican government, and then they started going and fighting the, the fascist forces again. And they were doing so successfully. After that happened, the, the uh, Stalin helped help bring back the Republican government, and by bringing back the bourgeoisie to Barcelona and backing the bourgeoisie and repressing the other elements that were fighting the fascists, he demoralized the left. That's what I'm saying. Well, why would you stage a workers' uprising against the Spanish Republic at a time when they're busy fighting the fascists? I that was the Spanish people and the and the Catalan people doing that, Caleb. That was an indigenous movement with very little influence from within. Because the majority, and they did not want the bourgeoisie to control Barcelona. They wanted to be the ones leading the fight against the fascists. And guess what? The revolt was quick. It was successful. They started fighting the fascists. All, all the internationalists should have started supporting them at that point. Instead, you had Stalin come in, and things ended up being sabotaged. Whether or not that was the intention, that's what happened. The left lost, didn't it? And so, uh, unfortunately, it was, was you had the rise of the and the Communist Party were trying to build a united anti-fascist front with people from different classes. And anarchists and Trotskyites were so committed to their bloodthirsty vision of permanent revolution. They were killing priests and nuns. And they were doing all kinds of things to alienate the Spanish Republic from the world. Um, and because of that, uh, they had, you know, at that point, uh, the communists uh, and, and the Spanish Republic clashed with the Trotskyists. I don't, I don't see... What's that? that the Spanish church backed the fascists. Um, I'm I'm saying that the Catholic Church is a huge institution that had you know people all over the world, and that when anarchists and you know Trotskyists executed nuns and priests, that was the worst possible PR. That was the best advertising you could have ever given Franco and fascism. It's ultra leftism, and when you you in order to defeat a fascist insurgency against the Spanish Republic, it was necessary to build a class collaborationist United Front. It didn't work. The Populist Front did not work. The United Front under Poon was working. It was starting to defeat fascism. You can't say it worked when Franco won in 1939. I, okay, well, I, I, we're going to have to disagree about Spain because I, I, I really doubt that Pum was on the verge of defeating the fascists and then, and then Stalin, the, you know, you know, they ruined it. Support, but they were doing pretty well in those battles. I've stu I studied them extensively. I'm not saying they were going to defeat them overnight. But they were doing pretty well. Was near as big as the Republic's army was. Was it anywhere near as big as the army of the Republic? The, the soldiers of the Republic uh, rebelled against their own government. The soldiers were of the, of the working class. And many of those soldiers joined up with Putin and other groups that were fighting the fascists. Okay. Well, let me, let me ask you also, um, you know, it, it seems like, you know, one of Trotsky's interesting points, I think, is that, you know, he was in France in exile, right? On the ver at the time, World War II is on the verge of breaking out, right? The Second World War is on the verge of breaking out. Trotsky's living in France in exile. And 
instead of saying that, you know, which was what the Communist Party of France was saying, which is we need to mobilize the people of France to build militias, to prepare to build an underground resistance if the, the Nazis take over and all of that. We need to prepare. We need to be anti-fascist resistance. Trotsky is saying, oh, you know, this is just like World War I. The Germans are our friends. French workers and German workers should just be friends. And it's the, the, the you know, the, the enemy the, defending the fatherland. Oh, this is, you know, he was pushing revolutionary defeatism at the moment when France was on the brink of being invaded by the Nazis. How is that defensible? All right. So one question to you. Have you read Fascism, What It Is and How to Fight It by Trotsky? Yes, I have. That was written at a time when everybody was underestimating Hitler. OK, so Trotsky was telling stop, stop backing the social Democrats, stop backing the people that killed Rosa Luxemburg, start backing the communists, start militarizing the, the workers. Stalin didn't do it because he didn't adhere with his one state, uh, his uh, socialism in one state. I believe Trotsky's criticism of the German Communist Party was completely opposite. They had the Red Front Fighters League. They had an armed militia. And Trotsky called them out for not aligning with the social Democrats, for calling them social fascists. Right. Trotsky thought that the German Communist Party was too opposed to the Social Democrats and wasn't effectively building a United there to be some, some tactical alliances with the more left elements of the, the Social Democrats. But Trotsky, you know, he wrote, for example, hands off Rosa Luxemburg. You know, uh, Stalin was was starting to be critical of Rosa Luxemburg and Rosa Luxemburg. Now you're talking way before Hitler. You're talking 1919, and, and the whole Bolshevik party was united in supporting Rosa Luxemburg. I'm sorry, we're talking over each other. What was that? Um, well, Rosa Luxemburg died in 1919. Yes. Yeah, and that was way before Hitler, way before any of that, and the whole Communist International supported Rosa Luxemburg. Did I say that Stalin criticized her when she was alive? Stalin gave a speech against Rosa Luxemburg's legacy long after she died. Trotsky responded to it. All you got to do is Google Trotsky hands off Rosa Luxemburg. He wrote about that. Years, years so, after her death. Years after her death. So Stalin wanted the, 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 the bourgeoisie back in, in Germany. And there was divisions. And the Soviet Union didn't work uh, strong enough to get those left elements of the Social Democrats that were not with the mainstream to work with the, with the militant Germans. That, that, that's, Wait, I'm sorry. So you're saying that because Stalin was critical of Rosa Luxemburg years after her death, this means Stalin didn't want the workers to be in power in Germany? Is that no, what you might have believed that his strategy was the one that was going to work, but it didn't work every time. Einstein said making the same mistake again and again and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. It didn't work in China. It, it didn't work in that Eastern Europe became socialist. It, it, it worked in Germany. Socialism all over it, the world. I, I mean, I mean, that's just that's just false. I mean, Stalin saw oversaw a huge expansion of socialism. Meanwhile, Trotsky, you know, he operates on the basis of, oh, well, if I had been in charge, it would have been this way. Who's to say that? How can you say that? Oh, if Trotsky had been in charge, Spain would have been socialist. Oh, if say, if he he Germany would have been socialist. We don't know that. We, can't, we can see concrete results of. Stalin. Building an anti-fascist united front during the Second World War. Do you think Tito and Yugoslavia rose up because of Stalin? He was armed by the Soviet Union. He later became very critical of, this, of Stalin. In 1948, Yugoslavia cut ties. But the Soviet Union gave lots of support to the people of Yugoslavia, to the people of Albania, uh, to the people of China. People all over the world got support from the Soviet well, Union for fighting Stalin fascism. Because he said Stalin since Tito. If Stalin Soviet had his way and Tito was killed at that time, they would have been divided like they were in the 1990s. Thank God Tito stood up and, and threw out the, the, the Stalinist assassins and was able to stand up to the Nazis and, and to, the, to the Stalinists. You can't say Stalin's responsible no, for that. Stalin until 1948. His policy didn't work. Tito didn't denounce Stalin until 1948. I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, the Soviet Union supported Yugoslavia and armed resistance to the Nazi invaders uh, up until, you know, they supported the creation of Yugoslavia. Uh, you know, in fact, Enver Hoxha, the leader of Albania, he has a book called With Stalin. And the, the entire premise of the book is him arguing with Stalin about the fact that Albania is not part of Yugoslavia. It's a separate country. One question, one question real quick. What was the one country in the common turn that refused uh, to uh, vote to oust Trotsky as a member? Um, and I don't know, what, was, what was the one country? 
And that would have been in 1928, we're talking, right? Right, when, yeah. again, we're skipping all over history here. We're jumping around. Um, but what country was it? Yugoslavia. Okay. As before, Yugoslavia was thrown out of the common term. And so Yugoslavia has always had an independent position. And, and so, and so uh, it's true that, 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 that they aligned with the imperialists. They supported uh, the United uh, States. Uh, <laughs> it, it is true that, that Stalin did good on the economy, on the economy, not on the political system or the, or the lack of freedoms, but on the economy for much of Eastern Europe. But at the same time, Stalinists like to embellish uh, Stalin's role in helping Yugoslavia. They pretty much did it on their own when they threw out the Nazis. Okay, well, look, I'm not here to defend Stalin on a personal level. I'm sure that there are things that Stalin did that were absolutely wrong. I'm here to point out that Trotskyism is simply, in, in essence, a problematic ideology. And again, show me a Trotskyist revolution that has ever happened. Well, do you think that Che uh, was, was Stalinist in 1967? Do you honestly believe that? No, I think that in many ways, Che's Che's beliefs were problematic. I mean, his policy in Bolivia, his pushing of armed guerrilla warfare, in some cases, it was a little bit ultra left um, and, it, and it caused problems. You know, Che was very heroic in the Cuban revolution. I'm an admirer of che, che Guevara in many ways, but I think that his his theory of trying to wage an armed guerrilla warfare in Bolivia, when you had a mass legal communist party that was participating, it, it wasn't necessarily correct. And that um, that his push for armed guerrilla warfare uh, in all circumstances, was a little bit ultra-leftist. And it's a lot like Trotsky. It's this belief that violence is the solution. You know, bloodthirsty permanent revolution. In some cases, you can achieve a lot, like Maduro has in Venezuela, by obtaining and taking power in a coalition, right? Yeah. And that, 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 I'm that, disagreeing with you on that, but let me just point this out. Yeah. Uh, are you aware of the pact that was going on in the late 1960s between Breshev and President Johnson? Premier Breshev? of that and that started with khrushchev mind you right khrushchev who you seem to admire was trying to hold back anti-colonial struggles around the world was very supportive of, of of the cuban revolution and and revolutions going on in latin america khrushchev was deposed and when breshev took took over and made soviet union fully stalinist again he made a deal with, with, with so you're uh, saying that hold on let me make the point then you can respond to it and then you can you can you can tear it apart the point I'm trying to make is Breshev's pact, maybe you don't know the inner workings of the pact, but, but, but Breshev's pact that he had with President Johnson had said, the United States will not back counter-revolution in Eastern Europe. In exchange, the United States will not back revolution in Latin America. That's why when Che went to Bolivia and he met with the head of the Communist Party of Bolivia, Monge, Monge betrayed Che, refused the support that he had promised him, abandoned Che. That, that, that's what happened, and that was all because of a deal between the Soviet Union and the, and the, and the U.S. empire that sold Che out. That's just what happened. Nobody can deny that. Well, look, I'm, I, I feel that starting with Khrushchev, when Khrushchev had the doctrine of the three peacefuls, right, and rejected, he told people in, in Africa and Asia and everywhere to lay down their arms, that they had no right under any circumstances to defend themselves and engage in armed struggle to defend themselves. That was counter-revolutionary. And, and that started with Khrushchev. And actually, under Brezhnev, the Soviet Union escalated its support for various guerrilla wars. In the 70s, uh, you had the rise of, you know, all kinds of armed revolutionary groups. And, um, you know, and, and I mean, in the 70s, at that point, you had the Afghan Revolution. You had the Nicaragua, the Sandinista Revolution, which was supported by the USSR. Uh, you, you had all kinds of revolutions going on around the world at that time. You had the Derg in Ethiopia. Under Brezhnev, there were all kinds of revolutions being supported by the USSR. So the notion that Brezhnev didn't believe in socialist revolutions and arming them, that's 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 false. Now, did they, again. they have disagreements with Che Guevara? I don't I don't doubt that. And, and were they, they you said, with Nixon, the deal with Johnson and with Nixon, when Brezhnev was in power in the Soviet Union, only applied to Latin America. What was the result of that? The Condor years, Pinochet, uh, the Dell in Argentina. All these fascist regimes propped up. The CIA brought in these Nazis to back these fascist regimes, and they weren't getting the support from the Soviet Union that they needed. So, of course, Brezhnev backed revolutions. And let me finish. Of course, he backed revolutions in Ethiopia and all those countries. 
but not Latin America. That was part of the deal. That was that there was just a huge support in the Soviet Union in 1970. Again, for armed uprisings against Pinochet, for armed uprisings in Colombia, the Soviet Union and Cuba did a huge amount to support anti anti imperialist and anti fascist and anti colonial uprisings all throughout Latin America. To say that Brezhnev didn't support revolutionary movements in Latin America is just inaccurate. I mean, that's just that's inaccurate. Not, it was. That was not what was written in ink, and that's not what, what happened. So you can argue that the, the, the so, intention. Cuba, with Soviet support, was not training revolutionaries. Cuba didn't offer armed support to the people of Colombia. It didn't offer armed support to the, the Nicaragua, Nicaraguan people and the Sandinistas. I mean, I mean, this is China, just China supporting Latin America in, in the 1970s. Thank God, because that would have been a full assault on the left. Well, but let me it, ask you. Let me ask you. It was minimal. It was clandestine because of the deal that that Brezhnev had made with Johnson that continued on with Nixon. Now, let me ask you, you know, do you hold Fidel Castro responsible for Pinochet coming to power? No. OK, so how can you hold Stalin responsible for Hitler coming to power in Germany? Right. I mean, Fidel Castro supported the Communist Party of of uh, Chile. And there was let me answer that question, please. And you have a question. Let me answer. And fascist dictator came to power, right? Let me answer the question. Stalin supported the Communist Party, um, and they lost. And a fascist dictator came to power in Germany. How how can you blame Stalin for for let, Hitler's rise, and not blame Castro for Pinochet's let me, rise? Let me answer the question. So there was many contributing factors to the rise of fascism in Germany. Including the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the uh, you know forced reparations of the German people after the defeat in World War One. Of course, I don't blame it exclusively on Stalin. What I'm saying was his strategy didn't work and it helped foment it, but there was many other contributing factors. Now, as you know, Castro was very supportive of Allende, and it was crushing when Pinochet took took over. So I'm not going to blame Castro for that happening. And, and Cuba is a small nation. There's only so much they they can do. Uh, to help in Latin America. Russia and China, of course, are much more powerful. Right. But but if the logic that Stalin is responsible for the rise of Hitler, then Castro should be responsible for the rise of Pinochet. Sometimes communists lose, right? I mean, sometimes you're unable to defeat fascism, but that's not the fault. I don't see the equivalency here, Caleb, because uh, Cuba was not powerful like the Soviet Union. There was only so much they could do to support. Well, Cuba offered, they offered support to Allende, they met with Allende, they, they supported the policy. Um, they, didn't, they didn't call, again, you know, th this idea that you can never enter an alliance with the bourgeoisie. I didn't see Cuba calling for the communists of Chile to take up arms against Allende for being a fake socialist and not a Trotskyist. I didn't see that. You know what I mean? Um, I, you know, I mean, I mean, Cuba recognized <laughs> the right uh, and, and the necessity of forming a class collaborationist alliance in order to move towards socialism, just like the communists in China aligned with the KMT, right? Just like in Spain, uh, the, the communists aligned with the, the uh, you know, the, the republic, right? That, that when Caleb, you're doing socialism, it is necessary to have alliances. Uh, uh, yes, how, long have been, how, how long have we been debating now? Uh, it's about an hour and 12 minutes. Um, so oh. do you want to do closing statements and then we wrap up? Do you want to do a closing statement or? Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can, because you spoke first, um, okay. you can do the, the closing statement last. I don't mind doing my closing statement now. I didn't prepare it, so I'm okay. just going to, you know, speak. Uh, I'm going to improvise from based on what we were talking about. Sure. sure. That's fine, and then we'll, we'll be done. Sure. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is there is revisionist history, false narratives going around, and this is not necessarily Caleb's fault. He might hear some of these ideas, but this is going around with many different uh, journalists. Uh, some may be Stalinist, some may, may, may not be. Um, and I hope that I've, over the course of this hour plus debate, debunked that, that I've shown that a lot of these ideas stem from Marx, not from Trotsky, and that uh, Trotsky's intentions uh, for a worker's democracy were real, and that his strategy if fully implemented, would have probably worked. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the strategies that Stalin tried to implement did not work. I think that's the main point that I was trying to demonstrate over the course of 
this debate. Uh, there's also a stereotype or false narrative uh, that Trotskyists uh, are not supportive of, of Chavism or their pro-regime change or they're not authentic anti-imperialists. That's utterly false. It's Again, it's my view, and we could do polls on this, that the majority of the Trotskyists uh, support anti-imperialist governments and if, if at a minimal have sympathy for Maduro and, and Chavez and his legacy there. And all movements have been infiltrated. And you can't say because, oh, this former member said that, that that's an adherent of the entire ideology. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that I think, you know, those who are attracted to Trotskyism ultimately have the same goal as, as other socialists and other Marxists, as well as as anarchists, as social democrats. We all want to move toward the ideal world of a stateless, classless society in which, uh, you know, people can just do what they want and take what they need um, and that, that, you know, society is organized in a rational way um, in which everyone has what they need. Um, and I still maintain that, that Trotskyism is an ultra-leftist uh, deviation, right? That, that in the course of actually building socialism, it is necessary to have class collaborationist alliances. It's necessary to, to you know, participate in governments. It's necessary to, to take moves. And that, uh, that, that socialist countries uh, have been through extreme hardship, uh, that, that they have been attacked, they've been subject to extreme repression. And as a result of that, they've often had to become very authoritarian. And the way to support socialist countries uh, when they're you know, building socialism in the developing world and under attack is not to condemn them for being Stalinists, not to call them out for not being purely revolutionary, but rather to make clear uh, that the imperialists have no right to attack them and to point out their achievements in terms of economics, in terms of changing society. Um, and that, that, yes, there are, you know, there are some Trotskyists who would agree with me on that. And, and however, for the most part, uh, Trotskyism has degenerated into a way to distance yourself from the socialist countries. Most people around the world who call themselves Trotskyists don't do it because they really understand Trotsky's ideas. They do it because they want to distance themselves from the Soviet Union. They want to distance themselves from China. They want to distance themselves from Venezuela. And they want to say, I'm a true socialist. I'm a democratic socialist. These are evil totalitarian regimes. And it's, it is a, a gesture of capitulation, just like Khrushchev's secret speech in 1956. Right. Khrushchev wasn't denouncing Stalin because he was more revolutionary than Stalin. He was denouncing Stalin to say to the imperialists, don't worry, I'm not I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a, I'm not an extremist. I believe in the doctrine of the three peacefuls. I, I will bend over backwards to stop revolution around the world. Don't worry, I'm not a revolutionary like Stalin. The secret speech came from the right um, and that ultimately, um, ultimately, though, I, you know, it doesn't surprise me that in Venezuela, Trotsky is widely studied and people should study Trotsky. I have studied Trotsky extensively, and in fact, I will, I will conclude my ending remarks by just telling the story of the first time I read Trotsky. And, you know, I was a young person. I was about, you know, 13, 14 years old, and I was getting interested in socialism and communism. And everywhere, everywhere I went, everyone said to me, socialism and communism failed everywhere it's ever been tried. It, it's just been a complete disaster. It's led to the death of millions. It's never accomplished anything good. Um, and so because of that, um, I, I was still interested in socialism, and I knew that Trotsky had been killed by Stalin. And so based on that, I thought, well, I'm going to go read Trotsky, and maybe he will put forward a kind of socialism uh, that won't be counter-revolutionary or won't, won't, be, you know, won't fail everywhere it's ever been tried, won't lead to the death of millions. And so I went to the library, and I got his book, The Revolution Betrayed. And I read the first chapter of that book at the age of 13 or 14. And that chapter was called What Has Been Achieved. And it goes into great detail about how the Soviet Union was electrifying the whole country. It was carrying out a huge dramatic increase in agricultural production. It was you know, expanding the life expectancy. It was, it was providing health care and housing to the population. And I thought this can't be true because everyone knows that everywhere socialism has ever been achieved, it's done nothing but lead to utter failure and disaster. This can't be true. This, this must just be communist propaganda. So I fact checked it. And I went to the library and I got the encyclopedias. And lo and behold, what Trotsky wrote about the Soviet Union's economic achievements was true. And I learned that I had been lied to. This idea that socialism has just been a failure everywhere it's ever been tried, that's never done anything good, is a big, fat, imperialist lie. 
Um, and that it was from Trotsky that I actually learned uh, to to believe in socialism and to defend the socialism that has existed. Trotsky opened my eyes to that. Um, and it's interesting, though, because it was what Trotsky opened my eyes to. The fact that socialism has been successful and has worked has been the main reason that ever since then I was hostile to Trotskyism, because I saw Trotskyism as a movement that was differentiating itself from the socialism that has been successful, that I learned originally was successful from Trotsky. So I find that to be a little bit ironic, that Trotsky opened my eyes to opposing Trotskyism. Um, but overall, I think we all have the same goal. I think we have differences when it comes to history. But overall, let me just emphasize once again that revolutions are not made by, by intellectuals. Uh, they're not made by the revolutionary intelligentsia, by the youth and students. It's made by the broad masses of people who are so struggling, who are suffering, especially now with coronavirus. I mean, people are losing their jobs, and this is a, a big situation. And what the Communist Party did during the 1930s, where they built the unemployment councils and fed people and cared for people and fought for the, you know, the jobs and the rights of people, something, something like that is what is needed in this time. We need to start caring for people and fighting for their economic rights, because people are really suffering in this time. And I hope that some kind of united front could be built that would include you know, Trotskyists, Marxist, Leninists, anarchists, others, where instead of being in the movement, instead of being in the protest cage, instead of being this isolated sector of society that just believes in our ideas, we actually go to the masses of people and we actually give them the organization and the infrastructure they need to actually build a new society and, and, and build something. I'm for getting out of the movement and getting to the masses. That's what I'm about. I, I admire what the Communist Party did in the 1930s. I admire what the Black Panthers did during the 1970s. I admire what Bolivarianism has done. I admire what Baathist Arab socialism has accomplished in the Middle East. Um, I admire what socialism with Chinese characteristics has achieved. And I hope that eventually in this country we can develop some form of socialism with American characteristics uh, and, and apply socialist ideas to, to you know, the United States and the conditions that we're in. And I'll add that, you know, we should study Trotsky, we should study Stalin, we should study Hugo Chavez, we should study Mao, we should study all of these leaders, we should, we should study all of them, but we should blindly adhere to none of them. And we should figure out what will work in our time to get us out of this capitalist crisis. Al, I really appreciate you talking to me and, and putting forward your theories. Uh, you were a great defender of Trotskyism. I learned a lot from this debate, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Let's hope that uh, we can unite, you know, the, the youth and the workers and we can all advance uh, a society where there's both freedoms and a so socialist economy. That's what I want. All right. Thank you. Thank you.